We'll move on now to our next speaker, who is Julia Phillips, who received her PhD from the University of Bristol, following her research to examine how witches and witchcraft were featured in newspapers in Victorian Britain. And her presentation is titled A Victorian Educated Gentleman, Fraser and His Golden Bow in Context. So let me share my screen. Thank you for that introduction. And have everybody should have the screen. Can you see that? Cool. OK, thank yep. you. Yep. So um, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. That's uh, it's fantastic to be a part of this. I really appreciate it. Now, um, in this paper, I'm going to examine the way in which newspapers had a significant impact on the widespread and lasting popularity of Fraser and the Golden Bough. Now, other papers being presented at the conference are going to look at critical appraisals of Fraser's work and his contributions to the fields of folklore and anthropology. But in this paper, I'm taking a rather oblique approach and examining how he was perceived by popular rather than academic readers. So this approach uses evidence gathered by searching newspapers and journals published during his life, uh, considering not only the Golden Bough in its various editions, but also how Fraser the Man was viewed by the society in which he lived and worked. <clears throat> So these are the primary and secondary sources. Um, the newspapers broadly from 1890 to the years following the publication of the third and abridged editions. And these were the secondary sources that I used most in the preparation of the paper. Now, in her paper, Mary Beard asked, a very pertinent question. She said, why was the Golden Bough so immensely popular in the late 19th and early 20th century, not among academics and specialists who were often in any case skeptical of the claims of the Golden Bough, but among the middle brow reading public who bought it in staggering numbers? Beard suggests that the widespread coverage in newspapers played a significant role in the popularity of the Golden Bough. And as I shall show in this paper, the evidence of the primary sources supports that view. Now, the context of this extraordinary popularity lies with the culture of the Victorian age. In particular, the introduction of ideas about evolution, uh, the concept of new imperialism, which placed Britain at the apex of human development. The expansion of the British Empire encouraged the belief that the societies of countries and regions being colonized were inhabited by primitive savages who were being instructed and assisted by a country that was the epitome of educated civilization. Fraser and his contemporaries, such as Charles Darwin and Herbert Spencer, perfectly encapsulated the zeitgeist of the times, aided by newspapers that carried articles, reports of lectures, book reviews, and editorials to a voracious reading public. Now, this was all made possible by a dramatic growth in the press in the Victorian period, especially the provincial press, which is a category that included all British newspapers not published in London. Um, so briefly, a significant change to the regulatory framework was one of the primary factors in the growth of the newspaper industry. Uh, in particular, the removal of the so-called taxes on knowledge that um, occurred over a relatively short period of time. Uh, several historians have noted these changes were driven by financial rather than philosophical motives. Technological advances were also significant with the invention and rapid evolution of the steam printing press, automation in the process of compositing, the growth of the railways, and of course the electric telegraph. 
Alongside these technical and regulatory changes was societal change, and in particular, urbanization and industrialization. Now, as the 19th century evolved, newspapers became much more attuned to what we might refer to today as tabloid journalism. This style of reporting came to be known as new journalism and um, was strongly criticized by traditional newspaper editors as, and I'm quoting, attention grabbing, commercial, ephemeral and distracting. Uh, it was of course all of those things, but most importantly, new journalism sold newspapers, um, more reader friendly layout and inclusion of features designed to entertain and amuse increased the sales and circulation, which in turn led to a greater emphasis upon reporting the sort of popular material that attracted readers. So having briefly considered the social context of Victorian Britain and new imperialism and the growth of the newspaper industry, I'm going to have a look now at how this impacted upon the popularity of the Golden Bough. Uh, towards the end of 1889, Fraser wrote to George Macmillan to advise that the manuscript for what was to become the first edition of the Golden Bell was almost complete. Macmillan asked him to submit the manuscript straight away and then sent it to John Morley, who was Macmillan's friend and literary advisor, as well as being a liberal politician. You can see from this extract taken from Morley's response to Macmillan that he was enthusiastic about the manuscript. And his comments here set the scene for the reaction to the first edition when it was published the following year. Fraser had many detailed and specific ideas about how he wanted the Golden Bough to be printed and his success in retaining the copyright as well as getting agreement for a large print run demonstrates that he had a very solid grasp of commercial practices. This is an important point because new journalism demanded newspaper content that was informative and entertaining, as well as a product that was visually attractive and readily available for purchase in bookstores. So for comparison, publishers today will usually print between 250 to 2000 for a first print run of a book, depending on a range of factors. Um, for example, the first uh, the initial print run for the first Harry Potter book uh, was 500, which puts this into context. Fraser also had very definite ideas about the positioning of the Golden Bough in the book market. These comments from Fraser to Macmillan could almost be referring to a novel rather than a book with a scientific pedigree. The blurring of the boundaries between fact and fiction flowed into the way in which the book was promoted in the press and was, I believe, a strong factor in its widespread appeal beyond the academic world. Indeed, in 1909, Fraser made a very interesting comment about his rationale for choosing the title of the book. In a letter to Macmillan regarding his proposed title for another book, Psyche's Task, Fraser defended a non-academic title by saying, I believe Psyche's Task to be a much better title than the influence of superstition on the growth of institutions. The latter is not so much a title as a description. The former is compact, clear and striking. In exactly the same way, I believe that the title of The Golden Bough has won very many readers who would not have looked at a book called by a long abstract title, such as Studies in the Early History of Magic and Religion. Choosing the style, design and title of the book was clearly important to its success but it was Macmillan's advertising campaign in newspapers that launched it so effectively. These examples from 1890 and 1891 show the diversity of the publications in which the Golden Bough uh, was advertised. 
During my research, I also found a number of references to the Golden Bough in newspapers published in the Welsh language, which shows how extensively the book was publicised. This advert from 1892 was equally important, demonstrating another way in which members of the public could read the Golden Bough. It shows the typical advert placed by a lending library rather than a bookseller, which shows how accessible the book was to readers who lacked the funds to be able to buy it. Well, the Pall Mall Gazette began publication in 1865 and enjoyed contributions from authors such as George Bernard Shaw, Oscar Wilde, Robert Louis Stevenson. It, it also covered many important issues of the day and is considered to be at the forefront of investigative journalism. The Gazette was originally launched by gentlemen for gentlemen. But by 1883, the readership market had expanded significantly, which resulted in a healthy circulation estimated to be around 12,000 readers a day. Now, this example from the 14th of May 1890 shows the advertising by Macmillan and Co for the first edition of the Golden Bow. Um, it was being repeated on the 22nd of May, the 28th of May, the 29th of May, the 4th of June, the 11th of June, and the 17th of June. In addition to the advertising, two editorial style articles were published on the 3rd and 10th of June, all of which provided extensive promotion for the Golden Bow. I mean, if you assume only half of the 12,000 readers per day noted the advertising or the articles, that would still suggest that more than 50,000 people in London alone saw promotion for the Golden Bow during May and June 1890. One further point of interest is that the advertising is quite heavily weighted towards fiction, placing the Golden Bow in a popular rather than an academic context. It wasn't just advertising though. Uh, reviews, letters, commentary about the book and reports of lectures regularly appeared in the press. This example directs readers who may not be able to read the full text of the Golden Bough towards the latest issue of Folklore Journal, highlighting again the philosophy of new imperialism. The advert at the top of this page suggests that the Wilson Chronicle had a widespread readership including middle-class families, which ensured widespread dispersal of its content. Indeed, middle-class readers were told by newspapers that The Golden Bough was one of those books that any thoughtful person simply had to know about. That message spread to the self-educated working class and aspiring intellectuals, and they were all told that the Golden Bough explained how society and religion evolved from primitive societies. Here's two reviews of the first edition. Um, the first review emphasizes that the Golden Bough will be as attractive to the general reader as it will be to the academic student. While the second highlights phrases hard work and intellectual scope. Reviews were not always so glowing, and many of Fraser's peers were critical of his work. But from the outset, articles, reviews, and commentaries were widely published in newspapers and magazines, building an impressive groundswell of popular publicity aimed at the general reader, who, as Mary Beard notes, bought the book in staggering numbers. The publicity that followed the publication of the first edition ensured that the second edition, which was published in three volumes in 1900, was received with more than the usual amount of interest. 
This is very well demonstrated by the reviews that appeared in Folklore, the Journal of the Folklore Society. The first edition of The Golden Bough received just a single review. But the second edition achieved extraordinary coverage, being reviewed by no less than seven highly respected folklorists and anthropologists. The reviewers were all members of the Folklore Society and with one exception, held council positions in 1901 when the reviews were published. They were immersed in the world of folklore and anthropology, but meetings of the Folklore Society and its journal featured in the provincial and London press. So it had widespread popular as well as specialist exposure. The reviews in folklore were not entirely supportive, but they certainly did the job of promoting the new edition. Charlotte Byrne was one of the reviewers, and despite her praise here, she went on to write that she was very glad to observe that there seems to be no disposition in the society to take Fraser's views for granted, or to accept his theories without a close individual examination of his grounds for them. On a tangent, Charlotte Byrne has her own claim to fame, being the first female editor of the Folklore Journal from 1900 to 1908. Um, and she was the first female president of the Folklore Society from 1909 to 1910. As with the first edition, it was reviews and commentary published in the popular press that supported and promoted the wide sales of the book. These are just three examples of many I found while searching the relevant years of the newspapers. As a consequence of the high profile of his books, Fraser frequently appeared in newspapers with details of public engagement, including guests of honour at dinners and meetings. He also lectured widely and was often asked to greet visiting VIPs, all of which gave Fraser a very high public profile in uh, Edwardian Britain and continued to keep the golden bough in the public eye. Uh, as noted by Mary Beard again, uh, the enthusiasm for Fraser's books, however extravagant, did not in fact equal the enthusiasm for Fraser the man. Uh, as mentioned um, earlier by Ronald, uh, he received a knighthood in 1914, um, at the same time as uh, several other dignitaries, uh, including a peerage for Viscount Kitchener, and um, in a number of other awards, some of which I've listed here. Ronald mentioned a fellowship of the Royal Society and membership of the Order of Merit. And these really are just a very few of the awards that were given to Fraser. Uh, the third edition of the Golden Bow is generally dated from 1911 to 1915. And as noted earlier, publishers today will print between 2000, uh, 250 and 2000 for a first print run, depending on a range of factors. Um, and from my cursory review of publishing sales today, they will be delighted to get the 36,000 sales that the third edition of the Golden Bow generated. And then in November 1922, Macmillan published the abridged version, which sold more than 33,000 copies in the 11 years following its publication, even though it cost 18 shillings per copy. In 1957, a paperback version was published and the abridgment has never been out of print since it first appeared. Commentary and reviews of the third edition and abridged version are plentiful and often follow the style of these examples. And quite often references to the Golden Bough take the form of reviews of other anthropological books 
which are compared to uh, the Golden Bell, uh, or whose authors reference Fraser, sometimes positively and sometimes rather critical of his work in theories. But my intention in this short paper was to place Fraser and the Golden Bough within the context of Victorian and Edwardian Britain, and especially to show how the rapid expansion of the newspaper industry promoted widespread public recognition of the author and his work. Now, other speakers are far more qualified than me to discuss Fraser's impact upon the study of folklore and anthropology, but I hope my rather oblique approach has added something to the story of this intriguing man. Um, in closing, I would just like to say that in the 1970s, when I first began to study occultism and paganism, I was told by everyone I encountered that I simply had to read The Golden Bell. And even today, it has a popular appeal that other books of its time and subject have simply never achieved. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'd appreciate any feedback and, of course, any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. That was very interesting.